how difficult it is to survive in the post-apocalyptic world, in addition to dealing with zombies, but also to face the shortage of supplies. After eight months of escape, Rick's team has been able to kill zombies skillfully. Even Carl can also stand alone. Killing zombies is not soft, and they face the biggest problem is the shortage of food. Daryl didn't even spare an owl. After a search, the few available supplies can only find two cans of dog food. The young face is full of determination. Pregnant Lori is close to delivery, but they still have not found a safe shelter. They intended to take a break here. Carl wanted to open the dog food to taste. But the adults did not say anything because they had lost track of how many times they were hungry. All faces were written with fatigue, but did not have time to rest well. The zombies outside had gathered over, they had no choice but to hurry to evacuate. The whole process without the slightest delay, they did not have too much to say to each other. On the one hand, because of the long fatigue of running around, do not want to talk. On the other hand, they have a very tacit understanding between. Before they left, they took all the weapons they could carry, then closed the car door and left quickly, it didn't take long for them to stop on a road. Rick let everyone take a 15-minute break in place, and Carl and Beth took up daily sentry duty. The crowd took out the map to study the new escape route. They went around and around for a long time, almost all the places around them, and not far from them there are still two zombie swarms. Although only about 150 people zombie swarm, but still not now they can deal with. If they meet, then they can only abandon the area, Herschel reminded Rick. Lori can no longer so running, to find a safe place as soon as possible, rest for a while, cannot let the child born on the road. Finally, Rick decided to head southwest, hoping to find a landing spot as soon as possible. Afterwards, Daryl wanted to take advantage of the break to go hunting in the woods with Rick. Maybe he could get some game. The two looked along the railroad, but here they saw a prison. This was their dream habitat. No place would be safer than here. Surrounded by a strong fence, high guard towers, and strong walls. Rick was overjoyed. They finally had no need to run around. Soon, the crowd came to the outside of the prison. Rick quickly cut an opening in the barbed wire fence, and everyone immediately drilled into it, to the inside aisle, and then used the wire to fix the gap. This road should be the only way in and out of prison. Inside is a square where prisoners move around, and the aisle is very safe without a zombie. Rick led the group to the prison entrance. He began to observe the situation inside. If you can close the door on the far side, you can first clear the square of zombies. But to close the door, someone must enter the square full of zombies. Glenn volunteered. He is the fastest here. Rick refused. He let the two and Beth attract the attention of the zombies behind the fence to kill the approaching zombies. Daryl to the right sentry tower. Carol in the vicinity of the shooting cover. Herschel and Carl on the left sentry tower to kill zombies. And the most dangerous thing Rick left to himself. After the distribution of tasks, we quickly began to perform. Glenn a few people struggling to attract the zombies. Waiting for the zombies close to killing with the cold weapons in hand. With some of the zombies attracted and Rick ready, Lori opened the door and he felt his way in. In the team, Rick was able to convince everyone because, in addition to his calmness and commitment, he always put the team first. The zombies inside were attracted away, and Rick's pressure was also reduced. He walked and killed the zombies nearby. The people on the sentry tower were also desperately covering, and Herschel and Carl were also shooting wildly. Despite having been on the run for eight months, there are few opportunities to practice shooting like this. Carol accidentally almost hit Rick's foot. The woman used to be timid, but now she can raise her gun and fight. Rick smoothly rushed to the iron door. He dropped the gun in his hand. While the zombies inside had not reacted, he kicked to open the nearest zombie, quickly closed the door, and locked the door with tools. After doing this, the zombies behind him surrounded him. Rick picked up the gun on the ground, solved the nearest two zombies, opened the door to kill the inside, and hid in the sentry tower. After that, all you have to do is to clear out the zombies in the square. All you have to do is to kill them from a distance. And in a short while, the zombies in the square were all cleared out. And the crowd looked a little excited. The months of repression were finally released. Since the fall of the farm, they finally have a safe haven again. Soon, nightfall, the crowd sat around the fire. The, the rack roasted owls. People are thinking about how to build the place afterwards. Good thing Herschel is the best at this. Only Rick is still constantly checking the fence. Although it has been turned three times, but still uneasy. Afraid that there will be missed places. Carol brought some food to Daryl on sentry duty. She was a little emotional. Rick has made her completely happy. He has brought the whole team up to now. Which is everyone including Shane cannot do. 
Without him the team would have fallen apart. Afterwards Beth sang a song for the crowd, a song she hadn't sung since the death of her mother, a beautiful song that washed away the darkness and made people who had been on the run for so long feel a touch of warmth. After everyone finished eating, Rick let everyone rest early. Today he came to keep watch, tomorrow there is a hard battle to fight, they won beautifully today, he knows everyone is tired, but they have to work a little more. Outside the square is not safe. Rick said I observed that most of the zombies here are wearing prison uniforms, indicating that the place fell to the beginning, and the prison are infirmary and canteen, and even the armory. Our ammunition is now few left. Tomorrow we need to go inside and zombie close combat. Hearing this, we are worried. Rick reassured everyone we have been through so much together. The prison has the food, medicine, and weapons we need. There are stronger defenses, and we will win. Afterward, Lori finds Rick alone. She wants to talk to Rick and ease their relationship, but Lori had broken his heart after treating him like that before when Rick was at his worst. He still cares for Lori, but never like before. He can never forget the way Lori looked at him. Rick turned his head and told Lori to go to Herschel if she wanted to talk, and then walked away. The next morning, Rick a few people opened the door inside. In the long-term cooperation, a few people have been very tacit understanding. They close together, respectively, killing the zombies in front of them, after killing quickly withdrawn to ensure that the back is always teammates. The few people outside are also frantically attracting the attention of the zombies. Pregnant with nine months of lock Lee also participated in the action, only to alleviate the pressure of the few people inside. Several people maintain the formation slowly deep inside. T-Dog picked up a shield aside and directly knocked the zombie down. Maggie immediately rushed up to fill the knife and then quickly ran back to the team. Such combat ability is their time on the run. Between life and death, many times honed out. When they slowly went deeper inside, they found that there was a large group of zombies inside, and several people quickly hid but they were still discovered by zombies wearing riot suits. Their defense even Daryl's crossbow arrows cannot penetrate. A few people in the hands of weapons simply cannot work. Now the only way to close the door. Rick quickly locked the door. Behind a few people are still struggling to support. Maggie soon found a way to kill the zombies from the neck easier. She looked excitedly at Glenn. The others rushed to follow suit. Easily solved the zombies. The last zombie was also taken out by Maggie. The yard zombies were also cleaned up by several people. Glenn wanted to let the group in, but Rick stopped him. The courtyard was not safe enough. They could not risk it. They had to clear out some cells. The cell aisle was much stronger than the outside. A few people came to the door. Daryl was responsible for opening the door. Rick was ready to kill the zombies, but with the iron door opened, it was surprisingly quiet inside except for some clutter, and he did not see zombies. Rick carefully came to the sentry post where there are usually guards, and rushed up to take a look. The people inside had been killed. Rick found in his body cell keys. After opening the cell door, the place is also cluttered, but they did not see the figure of zombies. A few people checked all the rooms and found only two zombies were locked in the cell. They seemed to have been starved to death before life. After the zombies were cleaned up and thrown out of the cell, this is their habitat. After all, this place is safe enough. Rick let everyone rest here for the night, and tomorrow set out to find a restaurant and infirmary. Thankfully, although this place is dirty and messy, the room is very much, and there are mattresses and quilts. They have yet to remember how long has not slept in such a soft bed. Although it is in prison, Rick leaned against the wall. This time he was really too tired. Now finally can rest. The survivor team has been on the run for eight months in the end of the world, and now they have accidentally found a prison, which can be called a rare sanctuary in the post-apocalyptic world. Rick spent two days clearing the square and parts of the prison of zombies. Now that there is very little food left, they must find the prison's canteen and infirmary as soon as possible. By the next day, everyone will be looking for weapons all collected together, ready to search the rest of the prison. The crowd began to organize the equipment. Carl originally wanted to follow the action, but was stopped by Rick. The prison aisles were dark and quiet with a few long-dead bodies lying on the floor, and since they didn't find a topographical map, they had to feel their way forward, marking the walls as they went to make sure the team could find their way back. But not long before Rick found an anomaly, the corpse on the ground had obviously just been chewed, and there were probably zombies nearby, a few people immediately on guard. And when they came to a corner, there was a large number of zombies gathered there. Rick hurriedly shouted for everyone to retreat Rick called for everyone to flee, but zombies had already occupied the road they came from. No way. The crowd can only run towards the depths. 
but the last Maggie and Glenn were suddenly blocked by zombies. In order to avoid the zombies, the two could only hide in a side room. A few people escaped safely only to find that Glenn and Maggie did not follow. They could not leave the two behind, and we could only return to the aisle again, but the original zombies were here but did not know where to run. Whenever passing the fork in the road, Herschel would always call the names of two people. At this time, Glenn and Maggie also heard no movement outside, carefully opened the door, and came out. The same softly called out to the crowd. Coincidentally, Herschel heard, he slowly came this way, but then the accident happened. The corpse on the ground suddenly rose, a bite on the calf of Herschel, Heard the screams Rick rushed over to support. In a hurry to shoot the zombie to solve. Glenn. Two people heard the sound also rushed over to see her father was bitten. Maggie was a time of pain. But now was not a time to be sad because just the sound of gunfire. The nearby zombies all attracted over. Rick and Glenn rushed to pick up Herschel ready to retreat. But the way back is also all zombies. Finally. The crowd can only come to a door. T-Dog with tools to break the handcuffs on the door. Open the door after the crowd quickly rushed in. As the door was closed, the zombies behind them also caught up. T-Dog rushed to use the iron bar will be stuck in the door. And here is the canteen they are looking for. Herschel lying on the floor moaning in pain. Maggie some panic and does not know what to do. Rick immediately decided to cut off Herschel's calf. He let Daryl hold him down, tightening the thigh with a belt to avoid excessive blood loss. And then picked up the axe, the pain deep into the bone marrow, so that Herschel directly passed out. After doing this, Daryl found that there were even people inside peeking through the window, hurriedly whispered to Rick to squat, then took out a crossbow and aimed at a few people, not expecting that there were still living prisoners inside. While a few people inside were shocked by Rick's behavior, then a few people came out from inside. They thought Rick and others were a rescue team, but did not understand why they had to cut off Herschel's calf. Herschel's leg is still bleeding. Several people simply do not have time to pay attention to these prisoners. The priority is to hurry to bring Herschel back. Glenn rushed directly into the cafeteria, cleaned out a cart inside, and put Herschel on it. Now we must leave here immediately. After getting ready, T-Dog opened the cafeteria door. Fortunately, there was only one zombie. T-Dog quickly solved it, and several people rushed to evacuate the place. The dumbfounded prisoners were a bit confused. They did not know exactly what was happening, so they decided to follow these strange people out. The good thing is that the way back was very smooth, and they did not meet the zombies. Soon, they rushed back. Daryl quickly opened the iron door, and the people carefully put Herschel on the bed. At this moment, he was unconscious. Now the team has no medical supplies. The situation is very critical. Carol and Lori can only use towels to stop his bleeding, but this is very inefficient to stop the bleeding. At this time, outside the sound of arguing, Rick told everyone to calm down he would go out to check. Before leaving he explained to Glenn if Herschel did not hold up, turned into a zombie, must not be emotional, and must ensure the safety of everyone. Glenn promised, he knows what to do. Afterward, Rick rushed to the outside. It turned out that just when everyone was desperately trying to save Herschel, Daryl had been on guard outside. He used a crossbow aimed at the only entrance here. Not long after, just a few prisoners came in from the darkness. The leader of Tomas told Daryl that inside was their cell. Now they wanted to go in. Daryl directly refused and told a few people you were lucky. George Asia had pardoned you. Now you can go. After hearing that they could get out, several others felt they should leave there immediately. They had been stuck there for too long, and all wanted to get out and find their families. Tomas but very alert. Ordinary citizens suddenly broke into the prison, which meant there was no place to go outside. Daryl let him go out to see for himself. Tomas wanted to break in. T-Dog directly with a gun came out, and the atmosphere was instantly tense. Just as the two sides were at war, Rick arrived and gestured that we could talk it out. But Tomas asked a few people in return. A few people are silent. T-Dog and Daryl look a little speechless. Feelings of the end of the world outbreak for so long. These people do not know anything. After Rick's questioning, several people said that when the prison had an unprecedented riot, some prisoners and guards began to attack people around them like crazy, and it soon turned into an unparalleled riot. One guard locked them into the canteen to protect them and left his gun behind, saying he would be back soon. But now 10 months have passed, and they had expected a rescue team to come soon. Rick told them there would be no rescue team. There was no government. No hospital, no army, and nothing out there now. A few people were in disbelief. And then they came outside. And the prisoners, who had been locked up for nearly 300 days, finally saw the sunlight again. And they had never missed the wire mesh so much. 
But after seeing the bodies around them, they had to believe Rick's words. Tomas also realized that now the prison is a safe place. He immediately had other ideas. He told Rick you could live outside in the open space, where it would be more comfortable. The implication is ready to take over the whole prison. Rick did not get angry just nodded and said that they intended to use it to grow crops. They destroyed the zombies here. The prison belongs to them. But Tomas did not want to give up. Claiming that they were here first. The prison should be theirs. Rick laughed. Tomas did not care about this and said this place was theirs. The two sides instantly saber rattling. T-Dog also leaned over with a gun. Rick behaved very calmly. The other side. As long as the action he would quickly wipe out a few people. Daryl is also on the sidelines. Ready to go. Tomas sees the situation is not good. Feels Rick and a few people are not easy to mess with. Can only temporarily concede. And let Rick and a few people help clear out some cells. Rick guessed that the canteen must have stored a lot of food to make a few people stay in it for 10 months and still fat. Rick offered to use half of the food in exchange before helping them to clean out a cell. Followed by Rick's warning to a few people. This time Tomas did not dare to retort. He felt the obvious killing intent from Rick. At this time several people came to the canteen. Rick saw so many supplies when some shock. Since the escape. He had never seen so much food. Rick counted. Temporarily brought back apart. Everyone can finally eat a full meal. They have never been so rich. But there is also bad news. That is. Herschel is still in a coma. And whether he can survive depends on himself. Rick asks Glenn to use his handcuffs on Herschel handcuffed. And although he hopes that Herschel can survive. He still wants to be just in case. Afterward. Lori found Rick and asked about the prisoners. Rick said he would help them clean out a cell. Living under the same roof is risky. But for now. It's the only way. But Lori said if necessary. They could all be killed. Rick some sigh. And now you say killing is okay. Lori is still explaining. But Rick never forgets the look in her eyes at first. Although Lori understood Rick is not a cold-blooded killer and has been thinking about the big picture. Everything is too late. Rick now simply do not want to talk to her more what. Waiting for the afternoon. Rick is ready to lead a few people to clear out of the cell. Before the action. Daryl told them that until the last resort. Try not to shoot. The sound of gunfire will only attract more zombies. Rick also warned several people no matter how close the zombies were. They must maintain the formation. Don't run around. Kill zombies. Must attack the head. Listening to Rick and other people's lectures. Tomas acted very disdainfully. He doesn't need Rick to teach him how to kill. Then. The crowd began to move. They carefully in the aisle forward. At this time. Two zombies appeared in front. Without waiting for Rick several people gave orders. Several prisoners shouted and rushed up. Then Rick a few people are shocked. You guys are sure not to be funny. These people together is not as good as Carl. Three people want to turn their heads and leave. Ten months after the outbreak of the zombie virus. The group still knows nothing about the outside world. Rick agrees to help them clear out a cell. But only if they share half of the supplies. Before they leave. Rick tells them that to kill a zombie they must attack the head. But the other side doesn't care. After all. Killing is what they do best. But when they encountered the zombies. The prisoners rushed up with their weapons screaming. And did not attack the zombies heads. Watching the prisoners like a street fight. The three have never been so speechless. Rick could not stand to see it and rushed forward to correct. At the same time. Carl walked back to the cell with a happy heart. The crowd was still worried about stopping the bleeding. Carl came in with a bag. Opened it. And saw that it was all medical supplies. The people were very surprised. Carl explained that he had fo Carl explained that he found it in the medical room and killed two zombies along the way. Lori is very angry and scolds Carl for not acting alone. He must be accompanied by adults to go out. Carl runs away in anger. As Lori and Rick's relationship becomes strained. Carl is intentionally distancing himself from Lori. On the other hand. The crowd continued to move forward. In Daryl's demonstration and Rick's teaching, these people finally understood how to deal with zombies. After killing to retreat to maintain the formation, several people are already desperate people, quickly mastered the method. But the last big man, seeing such a scene but began to feel afraid. As more and more zombies, he began to gradually backward, but did not notice. Behind a zombie was slowly approaching. The zombie's broken hand directly cut his back. Luckily Rick saw the situation and came over to help in time while Tomas fired several shots at another zombie. The big man touched the injured back and hurriedly explained to the crowd that he did not feel the difference certainly will not become a zombie. In the crowd difficult to know how to deal with. Tomas rushed up. Directly put the big man on his head smashed down hard. Until the smashing of his head. Blood and flesh. Rick saw the scene. 
Tomas's defense deepened. These prisoners are sinister and cunning people. Maybe at some point we'll be on them. Not only Rick but Daryl also felt the danger of Tomas. As long as Rick gave the order, he would immediately kill Tomas. After that, everyone went to the laundry room. After such a long time of cleaning, now only this last place was left. Daryl threw the key directly to Tomas. They would not leave their backs to these people. Rick told Tomas that if he wanted his cell, he would have to open the door himself. And note that he could only open half of it. Otherwise the number of zombies would be too large to control. Tomas had no choice but to go forward. But played a trick. Directly opened all the doors. The zombies inside all rushed out. There is no time to argue only to deal with the zombies in front of you. Everyone is leaving no stone unturned to slash and kill. Suddenly. Tomas a knife to Rick. But Rick dodged in time. Or certainly killed here. Rick did not speak. Just a deep look at him. Then Tomas and pretend to be fine. Will be a zombie pushed Rick. Rick directly by the zombie pounced on the ground. Daryl hurriedly let T-Dog fill the position and quickly rushed over to solve the zombie. The two did not speak. Just looked at each other. Daryl instantly understood Rick's meaning and picked up the crossbow aimed at several people. Soon. The zombies were all removed. Rick looked at Tomas. Tomas explained. It's coming at me bro. Yeah. Yeah I get it. I get it. Shit happens. Rick just quietly looked at Tomas, and then a knife was chopped down. A side prisoner tried to resist, but was kicked to the ground by Rick. Feeling bad, the prisoner immediately ran towards the passage and headlong into the zombie pile. He rushed back, but how could Rick give him the chance to close the iron gate and let him fend for himself? After that is to solve the two remaining prisoners, but both said they had nothing to do with this matter. Lou got down on his knees and begged, saying that he only fiddled with contraband, never killed anyone, and Vincent was only a maintenance man, and he wouldn't kill anyone, sensing that the two were not bad guys. Rick did not kill them, but instead fulfilled his previous promise to take them to the clean cell. Then Rick the two were about to leave, but Vincent felt it was too cruel to leave them here like this. Rick told them that this part of the area belonged to them, this was the original agreement. Take it or leave it. And Daryl told the two men. You think this is sick? You don't want to know what's outside. Consider yourselves the lucky ones. And Herschel sighed. A few people found that he had no heartbeat. Lori rushed to resuscitate him. But suddenly, Herschel a hug Lori. They thought Herschel had turned into a zombie and backed away in fear. While Carl, who was standing by, raised his gun. After a long time, Rick and the others finally came back. Herschel was out of danger, Rick unlocked his handcuffs, and Herschel held Rick's hand tightly, thanking Rick for saving his life. On the other hand, Carol is also preparing for Lori's delivery and is practicing with the zombie corpse. She doesn't want to be overwhelmed when something unexpected happens. The next day, Rick a few people cleaned up the car blocking the door, in case of an emergency. Everyone can just drive away. After to deal with the bodies in the prison, Rick found that Glenn and Maggie do not know where to go. Daryl pointed to the distant sentry tower and said the two went up last night. And now they should still be up there, probably still in the man-making program. At this time, T-Dog, however, looked into the distance, and Rick is also a change of face. The original two prisoners into their territory. Rick went up to question the two, but the two said that there were corpses everywhere inside. Don't want to live inside. Lou difficult to plead Rick. Let them join he team. They and Tomas really have no relationship. But the result was that Daryl locked them up. Rick was adamant and did not agree to let the two join. And he did not want to risk everyone. But T-Dog thinks they are very sincere and don't look like bad guys. To drive them away is undoubtedly to kill them. Carol thinks that everyone has gone through so many trials and tribulations. So hard to find a new shelter. What if they want to take possession? Maggie also said they could not accept it. They are, after all, prisoners. And they do not know them. In the end. Rick decided that he would not let the two join. Rick a few people to go to the woods to find someone to burn the bodies. The two men locked up, gave them some of the supplies. Lori and Beth made a pair of crutches for Herschel and took Herschel outside the cell for practice. Rick three people saw the scene from afar and were happy for him, as if everything is going in the right direction, but the change often comes so suddenly. Walker! It was a deer that had been gnawed by the zombies and was being dragged towards the prison at the moment. The smell of blood attracted the attention of the zombies, and the chains on the door were quietly cut, followed by a bloody piece of meat placed out of the doorway, and they all think that everything is to the good development. But at this time, the depths of the prison ran out of dozens of zombies. Carl found immediately alerted the crowd, 
Rick also saw the situation in the distance, began to run back to the madness, shouting for everyone to hurry to find a place to hide. Maggie and T-Dog, two people, rush to this side. Carl is also constantly shooting to protect everyone. Glenn is anxious to repair the gap and then carries a large knife to run back quickly, but the number of zombies is too much. A short period of time simply cannot be removed. Lori and Maggie hide in the C section of the prison, Herschel and Beth are hiding on the other side. Maggie three people want to go back to the cell to hide temporarily, but inside are also all zombies. They hurriedly turn around and run to the back of the aisle. Rick! Several people finally ran in. Two prisoners also followed the rush in. T-Dog found that the zombies were still pouring in. Someone opened the door, and he ran to lock the door again but did not notice the zombies behind him. He was bitten on the shoulder. T-Dog broke away from the zombies and rushed into the room with Carol. The two of them ran towards the dark underground passage. At this time, Rick finally arrived late, and they quickly killed the zombies inside. Herschel told Rick that Maggie had taken Lori and Carl into the sea zone and that T-Dog had been bitten by a zombie when he closed the door. Glenn ran over and told Rick the door chain had been hacked with an axe. Rick turned his head and looked at the two prisoners coming up behind him. Who else could it be if not them? But at this time, the prison alarm suddenly sounded, if not quickly turned off. All the nearby zombies will be attracted to. Rick pointed his gun at the two prisoners and loudly questioned them about what was going on. Vincent explained that it must be a backup generator, which is prepared by the prison for emergencies. But the prison was closed after the invasion. He has no idea how it could have been opened. And worse, if the power had been sufficient, the main prison door would probably have been opened as well. No time for nonsense. Rick was ready to lead them to the others first. And after a few people quickly cleared the cell of zombies, they found that Lori and the others were not there at all. Glenn thinks they're headed deeper into the prison, and Rick is convinced that someone is playing them, and the most important thing now is to turn off the alarm, or the zombies will just keep growing. On the other hand, T-Dog's injuries in the underground tunnel are so severe that he can only grit his teeth and move slowly. The most important thing now is to get Carol to safety, but two zombies suddenly appeared in front of him, and the bullets in Carol's gun had already been shot out. T-Dog rushed straight up and pushed the two zombies against the wall, shouting for Carol to run. Carol did not want to leave T-Dog behind, but T-Dog said he was hopeless. Carol finally had to push open the door and leave the place. Lori three people ran into the boiler room to avoid the zombies. But at this time Lori felt like she was going to be born. Now there is no time to wait for Herschel or Carol. Lori tried to give birth by herself, but soon began to bleed profusely. Maggie checked the signs of obstructed labor, and now can only perform a C-section, but in such conditions Lori will certainly die. Lori insisted on keeping the baby, knowing exactly what she was up against. Lori then turned to Carl and said, Baby, I don't want you to be scared, okay? This is what I want. This is right. No, you you take care of your daddy for me, all right? And your little brother or sister, you take care of them. We'll have to do this. We are gonna be fine. You are gonna beat this world. I know you will. You are smart, and you are strong, and you are so brave. And I love you. I love you too. Looking at Carl's cheeks full of sadness, Lori really can't bear to let him go through such a thing. Then, full of reluctance to say, there is Carl is the proudest thing in her life. I love you said tightly hugged Carl, and this hug is goodbye forever. Lori instructed Maggie, after the end, please be sure to kill her. Maggie said she was sorry and then cut open Lori's stomach. The stinging pain instantly spread throughout Lori's body, and the immense pain made her faint. Maggie and Carl can only suppress the grief and continue to deliver the baby. Not long, the child was taken out, but the child did not respond. Maggie's heart is trembling, she gently patted the child. The child finally cried out. Carl also breathed a sigh of relief and rushed to take off his clothes to wrap the child, which is the mother with life. In exchange for the sister, Maggie told Carl we had to leave, but Carl remembered his mother's instructions before she died. They could not just go. Lori did not want to become a zombie. Just as Maggie was ready to take the weapon, Carl shook his head. Carl decided to give his mother one last ride. Maggie was heartbroken but respected Carl's choice. Carl looked down at his mother on the ground. He remembered what his father had said to him. All people have a death. He will die. And mom will die. You can never face death calmly. But you have to be strong to live. Carl kissed his mother's forehead with sadness. Maggie also came to the door with the baby in her arms. She checked the situation outside. The zombies were leaving the place. At that moment. The sound of gunfire. Maggie understood what this meant. And then Carl came out with a determined face. 
This cruel post-apocalyptic world forced a child to grow up early. On the other hand, Rick three people came to the distribution room, and the zombies behind still kept chasing. Rick anxiously asked how exactly to shut it down. Vincent rushed over and instructed Rick to close the gasoline valve and shut down the generator, but then someone with an axe suddenly slashed at Rick. He did all of this. The two people just wrestling together. Rick tried to shoot, but was shot away by the prisoner. The two again tangled together. Daryl some anxious, simply opened the door directly, just when the prisoner was about to cut Rick. Vincent hit the prisoner with an oil drum. Then Vincent picked up the gun on the ground and aimed at the two men. Rick did not know Vincent's ideas and looked a little nervous. A sight of prisoners was still fanning the flames. Kill Rick, and they could regain the prison. However, Vincent made another choice. Rick looked deeply at him and nodded, is also considered to accept him. Immediately after, Rick turned off the alarm in the prison. After that, they began to search for other people's traces. Waiting until the corner, they found two zombies gnawing at a corpse. Rick solved the zombie, then saw that it was T-Dog. They're sad. They had experienced so much together, but unexpectedly sacrificed in here. Not long after, they came out again to find Herschel and Beth because, so far, they had yet to find Lori or a few people. After learning that the three did not return, Rick was ready to continue to search. Just then, a baby's cry echoed in the empty prison. Maggie carried the newborn baby, and Carl came out together. Instead of the joy of a newborn, they were sobbing incessantly. Rick's mind was blank. He had realized what had happened, and he began to collapse, his body shaking uncontrollably. Oh. <laughs> Rick cried out loud in pain, before personally sent away his best brother, and now his wife has left him forever, although he has been resenting Lori these months, but he always loved her, the two have not yet eased their relationship, there is no chance to see each other again. This child was born in a post-apocalyptic world full of zombies. She is the continuation of life but also brings hope to the people, but her mother died in childbirth, the father in a huge blow, and mental problems, and even the baby's cries cannot hear. Rick picked up the axe and locked himself in a cell full of zombies. He needed to kill zombies to vent his anger. Herschel checked the baby's health. She looked very healthy but needed to eat baby food. Otherwise, she would not live long. Daryl said firmly, he would not let her die. They could not lose anyone else, and he had to go out to find baby food. Before he left, he urged Beth that Carl had just lost his mother and his father had become unhinged, and he hoped she would look after him. And then he took Maggie out to look for a formula. Glenn is in the square for the dead friends digging graves, and Vincent too also comes over to help. The previous events also let them win the trust of Rick and others, but Glenn wants to do these things himself because whether it's Lori or T-Dog, they're not friends anymore but real family, and Glenn wants to leave one for Carol. Vincent was very envious of a few people, he only had one such friend in his life, while Glenn had a group, because the team needed to do too many things, Glenn had no choice but to accept the help of two people. Herschel found Glenn, hoping he could go to persuade Rick, the two were a little sad. They had come here, but in three days, they lost three companions, especially T-Dog. He was the kindest in the team. If he hadn't closed that door, the casualties would only have been greater. Glenn suddenly said that, although it is not right, but he is willing to use the lives of others in exchange for their lives, the successive deaths of companions, so that the once kind Glenn will no longer easily trust any stranger. He does not want to experience such things again. Afterward, Glenn came to the Isle of the Sea area, where the ground was full of corpses. Rick surprisingly a person cleaned up all the zombies here. Finally, at the corner, he saw the figure of Rick. Glenn cautiously walked towards him, and see Rick was okay. Then rest assured. Then he said to Rick, Rick is now obviously in some delirium. Glenn's words as if he could not hear, his spirit has reached the edge of collapse. Until after seeing the person as Glenn, then let go, and a hand throws him out. After that, Rick continues to walk towards the depths of the tunnel. On the other hand, Maggie and Daryl also came to the family's nursery. Fortunately, there is milk powder and bottles. Daryl also caught a large rat on the cabinet, the night to the crowd to add a meal. It was late in the evening before Daryl and Maggie returned to the prison, where they were greeted by Glenn and Vincent at the door. Back in the cell, the baby had been crying for a long time. I did not expect Daryl. The tough guy actually liked the little guy and even take the initiative to do the daddy. After drinking his fill, the little one is quiet. At this point everyone remembered that they have not given the child's name. Carl wanted to use the name of the lost companion, but Daryl jokingly said, simply call him a small tug girl. 
the crowd got to relax at this moment. Perhaps this is the power of the newborn baby. The next day, Daryl went to the cemetery and put the Cherokee roses he had picked yesterday in front of Carol's grave because Carol made him feel the beauty of helping others. I never thought I'd never see again so soon. Rick in the cell also came to the place where Lori died, but her body had disappeared, leaving only a ground of blood and some broken meat. Walked a short distance, Rick found a zombie with a stomach, is leaning against the wall, apparently just full, did not see Lori, Rick's heart incomparable collapse. With a knife and this zombie kept venting their anger, he sat on the floor, his heart like death. When the sound of a baby crying came, bringing him back to his senses a little, and just then a shrill phone rang, not far away. In a small town, a figure broke into the store, she kicked the zombie down and then chopped off its head with a single slash, followed by two more zombies. She turned around and cut them down directly, then she arrived at the landing site. Inside, two zombies were locked up and made into human sticks. She was the mysterious person who had saved Andrea in the woods before. Michonne, eight months experienced too many things. Andrea still survived. Two people rely on each other, living a wandering life. I don't know how long it took. A helicopter flew from the sky. Inside sat several soldiers. They were heading towards the mission location, but the soldiers obviously underestimated the perilous nature of the human heart in the end times. The sudden sound of metal impact, so that the entire aircraft instantly out of control. Black smoke obviously they were under attack. In the end, the plane crashes into the woods. And this scene happens to be seen by Andrea and Michonne in the distance. The two then decided to rush to the crash site. Andrea had been feverish for a long time but could not find any medication to treat her. So Michonne told her to rest aside while she went to the helicopter alone to check if there were any survivors. Unfortunately, a soldier was thrown out and broke into two pieces on the spot. She was just about to check the cabin's interior but found a convoy coming this way not far away. Michonne had to rush to hide and then instructed Andrea not to make a sound. When the car arrived, several strong men came down from above. These people were well equipped, were veterans of killing zombies, do not know whether it was friend or foe. The two could only first sneak observation. Soon, these people found the pilot of the plane is still alive, and then dragged him out of the cockpit. Andrea thinks they are here to save people, they must not be bad-hearted, and they can join them, but Michonne is very cautious and refuses to do so. At that moment, the zombies behind her suddenly stirred up. In order not to attract each other's attention, Michonne directly chopped off two zombies' head, but when she crouched down again not long, there was a sudden movement behind her. The other side told them not to try to resist. When Andrea turned around, she found that the person was Daryl's brother Merle, who also recognized Andrea. And then the two were blindfolded and brought to a place. Merle took them to a place. Surprisingly, the people there did not give them a hard time but let the doctor for Andrea to carry out the treatment, Andrea asked the doctor what this place was, but the other side did not dare to say. At that moment, Merle came in and said he didn't expect him to be alive, right? When he first cut off his arm to escape the rooftop, but almost died because of blood loss, and then they brought him here, and now he is living a good life, and afterwards asked Andrea if his brother is okay. Andrea told Merle that they hadn't seen each other for a long time and that he and Rick had gone back to look for you that day, but he had disappeared. When he heard Rick's name, Merle hated his teeth. If that bastard hadn't handcuffed him to the rooftop, he wouldn't have broken his arm. Andrea told him that many people in the camp had died, and then Rick led everyone in the post-apocalyptic struggle to survive. And she and they had been separated for eight months, and now they were alive or dead. She was not sure. After listening to these, Merle also felt some inexplicable sadness. Not long, a handsome man came in. He was the leader here. They called him governor. But the perceptive Michonne immediately sensed that the man in front of her was no good. Now Michonne just wanted to leave here. But governor told her to go anytime. But today is very late. Why not go tomorrow? He would return the weapons to them and give them some food. And then governor took the two on a tour of the camp. Andrea could not believe her eyes. This was a small town. Clean and tidy. The air did not smell rotten, and the entrance and exit of the city were heavily guarded. This was simply a paradise in the post-apocalyptic world. Afterward, Governor arranges a place for two people to live. There is carefully prepared food and clean and tidy clothes. Andrea some incredulous. This is exactly the scene before the outbreak of the post-apocalyptic setting. The next day, the town was bustling with activity. The woman with her told Andrea that 74 people were living there, and they were all living a quiet life under the shelter of the governor. 
The town has not had a zombie invasion for 68 days. The survivors who live here must strictly abide by the rules set by the governor. They are not allowed to go out after dark. They try to avoid light and sound. And there are armed guards at the entrances and exits 24 hours a day. Andrea thought it was very nice here, but Michonne always felt a strange feeling. On the other hand, Governor arrives at a secret laboratory. Dr. Milton is studying the two zombies around Michonne. He found that after the jaws and arms are cut off, the zombies lose their desire to eat, and the scent they emit can help humans become invisible among the zombies. Governor admired Michonne's wisdom and invited them to have breakfast together. Andrea had already dropped her guard against Governor, while Milton was interested in Michonne's two walkers and asked him if he knew them originally. As a result, Michonne wants to avoid talking to him because she sees Governor, who has already taken her knife as a collector's item. Afterward, Michonne tells Andrea that she doesn't trust the governor at all and that they must leave here as soon as possible. While Andrea thinks she's too suspicious and wants to stay in town for a few more days before considering whether to go, Michonne was a little disappointed. But Andrea thought that the two had been together for eight months, and the two walkers had been staying with them and that she could kill them without hesitation. Michonne was so angry that she trembled a bit. Andrea so saw her. Why kill the two zombies? She did not know in her heart. And then she left with a disappointed face. The drivers who was brought back to the infirmary was also treated. And he told Governor that they were originally an army protecting a survivor base. Protecting a survivor base. But someone inside died and turned into a zombie, causing the entire base to fall. Only their squad escaped with supplies. They had agreed to meet at a clearing 60 kilometers away, but their plane was attacked and crashed in the woods. It didn't take long for Governor to drive up to the rendezvous point, and the military team was immediately alerted. Governor kindly stated that he had saved their teammate, Lieutenant Wells, and that he had asked him to come here to find them. Hearing the name of their teammate, these soldiers immediately relaxed their vigilance but did not expect Governor instantly change his face and directly shoot a sneak attack, killing two people, followed by the sound of gunfire in all directions. A sudden change of events hit them by surprise. Soon, the military squad was killed by all the techniques. Afterward, Governor brought the squad's cars and supplies back to the town, and all the town's residents gathered. Governor told everyone here that they had rescued a pilot yesterday who was begging him to bring his teammates to live in the town. But unfortunately, by the time they arrived, it was too late, and walkers attacked them. Although Governor brought back their supplies, each should be grateful and pray for those departed GIs. After listening to Governor's speech, Andrea felt that this place was perfect for her. While Michonne had a vague feeling that something was wrong, Michonne came to the car when no one was around to investigate and found bullet holes all over the car and a lot of blood on the vehicle. How could the zombies shoot at the car? There must be something hidden in this. Afterward, Michonne sneaked into Governor's office and got her weapon back. She looked through Governor's diary, which recorded the town's plans, but the list of zombie attack deaths behind it seemed very strange. After Penny's name, there were all vertical bars, and the list was so dense that she couldn't turn to the end of it. At that moment, Governor's voice came from outside the door, and Michonne had to leave the place. After that, Michonne sneaked into the back of the town, where she found many iron cages, and there was one full of zombies. Although I do not know what it is for, it was a scourge to stay. Michonne let all the zombies out. Michonne felt like she hadn't broken a sweat in a long time. Just right took these zombies to practice. No doubt, Michonne's skills in the early days of the outbreak of the apocalypse were also top level, and soon zombies were all solved by her. The man who came to feed the zombies happened to see. He took Michonne to the second floor governor's office, and instead of taking Michonne's weapon, governor told her that it was impolite to peep into other people's privacy. Although they keep the zombies in captivity, they are used for scientific research, and perhaps someday in the future, they will find a way to save everyone. After that, Governor starts to offer Michonne an olive branch. He says she have good skills and are not afraid of zombies. So why not join Merle's research team and live here forever? But Michonne snatched the knife back and put it directly on Governor's jaw. Michonne understands that the man in front of her is very dangerous, but until Governor does something to hurt her and Andrea, she won't make a move against him. After that, Michonne left the area, but Governor, a man with a grudge, quickly called Andrea over and complained that Michonne had broken into Governor's office, stolen a weapon, and then killed all the walkers in the town's custody. Andrea is a little confused as to why the town is holding walkers. Governor told her that they were experiments for the research institute. And then he said that Michonne had put a knife to his neck, which was a barbaric act. 
and that Michonne had brought the outside set into the town. Governor hopes that Andrea can go to persuade Michonne. Andrea was successfully brainwashed. Michonne wanted to leave here as soon as possible, but Andrea said that this place is perfect. It is she is too sensitive, and also accused Michonne in the town of all kinds of behavior. In the end, Michonne had to leave the place alone in disappointment, and Governor would not stop her at all for the sake of his image. When Michonne is away from the town, and then lets Merle with three people out to chase. But I did not expect that Michonne's combat power was so high that she killed three people before they could react, which was simply too scary. Not far away, Merle rushed to shoot, but Michonne was still hit in the thigh. After that, the two were chasing each other in the woods. I don't know how long it took, but Michonne finally got rid of Merle's pursuit, but she just breathed a sigh of relief when several more zombies appeared in front of her. Michonne was about to draw her knife, but the zombies walked right past her as if they didn't see her. Michonne realized that the blood of the zombies could hide scent. Michonne had nowhere to go but to an abandoned town when the sound of a car came from the distance. A red pickup truck came here. The visitors were none other than Glenn and Maggie. They came here to look for milk powder. Michonne just watched for a long time, and the two also found what they needed. Michonne heard their conversation and learned that they were living in prison. Suddenly, a man's voice came, and the two men were immediately alerted. Glenn recognizes the other man as Merle, who is not dead. Merle happily drops the gun in his hand and tells the two men not to be impulsive. Merle inquired about Daryl's whereabouts and was overjoyed to learn that his brother was still alive. Mal asked Glenn to take him to see Daryl, but Glenn simply cannot take such a dangerous man back to the prison. See the two soft, hard, do not eat. He shot directly from behind sneak attack. When Glenn ran over to take a look and found that Maggie had been held hostage by him, Merle told Glenn to drive away from here, and Glenn could only obediently do so. Mel will take the two back to town with the intention of asking for the address and then ransacking their camp. This is the man who lived the most dashing life in the post-apocalyptic world. He built an ideal town and let everyone live the life before the end of the world. In the eyes of the residents, he was kind and handsome, all-powerful, and even charmed Andrea to death. But it was all a lie. Governor and his men were often outside the burning and looting, then they return to the town and make up a perfect story for the residents, portraying themselves as a post-apocalyptic savior. Governor also has a zombie hiding in his room, which is his daughter, to find a way to save his daughter. The governor even used a living person to study the transformation process. Michonne feels that this governor is very hypocritical, so she firmly leaves town. That day, Merle came to Governor to report that they went after Michonne, but were killed three. Governor asked Merle to help them hold a hero's memorial service and then make up a story to tell everyone. Merle was afraid that Governor would blame him, so he lied that Michonne was dead and that the knife had fallen into the corpse and didn't bring it back. Merle immediately made up for it by saying that he had found an old acquaintance and his beautiful girlfriend, who looked like they were doing well, and that he would find their camp. The silly Andrea thought she had found Prince Charming, she didn't know that even Glenn had been caught. And on this side of the prison, Daryl three people again to check the prison, killed this zombie, Nack, with a dagger, which is not exactly Carol's. After the search, Daryl sat alone in the corner. From this knife, he could imagine how helpless Carol was at that time. This time, a door is repeatedly pushed outward. Daryl found before, thought there was a zombie inside, and did not put in mind, and now also to affect his mood. Daryl jumped up as a foot. Daryl just wanted to go, thought about it, or clean it up. Then he dragged away the body in the way. Daryl looked down, but it was Carol. She is still alive. It looks like trapped here two days of time. If not found, maybe starved to death inside it. Daryl is not good at expressing emotions, but his heart is very happy. And at this time, Rick changed into a clean dress coat and brought the child inside the courtyard. He degenerated for two days and finally came out of the passage because he still had a team to lead, a son to take care of, and even a newborn daughter needs to be cared for. At this point, Rick looked in the distance, as if there was something unusual. He walked while looking at the fence, even wondering if he was looking at it wrong, taking out his pistol, always on the alert. Outside the fence, there was a woman with a basket, and the zombies did not attack. The person who came is none other than Michonne. Michonne touched the wound on her leg. The pain is really unbearable. The zombies next to her immediately smelled the smell of blood on her hands and began to gather around. Michonne pulled out a long knife and resisted. Carl asks his father if he wants to help Michonne. Rick doesn't say anything and walks towards the door. The number of zombies surrounding her is increasing, and it's a piece of cake for Michonne if she doesn't get hurt. Tish. 
but unfortunately now she has difficulty moving, and physical stamina, has appeared vertigo, immediately fainted to the ground, before Michonne closed her eyes, she saw the zombies coming towards her and heard the gunshots, Carl shot and saved her, there were still many zombies outside, Rick cursed and rushed out to kill the zombies surrounding him, then he checked Michonne's body, her wound was a gunshot wound, so he took her back, because it is a stranger, Rick firmly cannot take her into the cell inside, and she can only be laid outside a mat, the first thing Michonne did when she woke up was to grab her weapon, but Rick kicked it away and told her that they wouldn't hurt her unless she wanted to do something stupid, this time Daryl walks out and shouts for the gang to come in and take a look, Carl, bring supplies, Rick tells Michonne that they'll hold her weapons, she's safe, and they'll help her heal up, the crowd wondered what Daryl was selling Guanzi, came inside to take a look, Rick also froze, but surprisingly it was Carol, Rick's face showed a long lost smile, unexpectedly Carol is still alive, they have long gotten along like family, they excitedly rushed forward to embrace, finally, Carol saw the baby in Beth's arms, the surprise overflowed, but immediately she thought of what, Carlyle has been using zombies and practicing c-section before, just to be able to help Lori one day, but I didn't expect to have no chance to meet each other, such a scene makes Carl sad again, he misses his mother, Carol was also excited to hug this child, she put her hope for Sophia, also put on this child, this touching scene also by Michonne looking at the eyes, after a while, Rick came to Michonne again and said that they could treat her, give her food and water, then send her out that here, but Michonne must tell them how she found her way here and why she brought, with her, powdered milk, Michonne spoke up this time and said that the powdered milk, which was left behind by an Asian boy and a pretty girl, was taken away from them, Daryl immediately got nervous and aimed his bow and arrow at Michonne, Rick told Daryl to take it easy, and Michonne then said that the people who took them were from the town of Woodbury, and there were about 75 survivors inside, Rick couldn't believe that there was still a camp the size of a small town, Michonne went on to say that a man calling himself governor was the leader, handsome and charismatic, like a cult leader, and there was a self-appointed paramilitary force, the fences were guarded, and the place was inaccessible to zombies, but the living could slip in, Rick raises one last question, how did she find them? Michonne said she overheard them talking, mentioned a prison, and she followed the wheel tracks to find the here, Rick then left Herschel to treat her, and Rick took Daryl to discuss the matter, and by now Glenn had been tortured beyond recognition, but he never revealed the location of the camp, and Merle taunted that, in the style of that good officer, he should have given up on them, Glenn retorted vicious that they would come to his rescue, these people are seriously underestimating Rick's abilities and will pay a terrible price in the future, Herschel had already helped Michonne with her wounds, and the always ice cold woman said thank you, and several other people also sat together in a meeting, there is nothing to discuss this matter, regardless of the dragon's den, must go to save Glenn, originally Rick wanted to go with Daryl two people, but others have also come forward, even Vincent and Lou have asked to join, they were ready with flashbangs, tear gas, and other weapons, Michonne also curiously asked Beth, this place is not all zombies before, just a few of them, killed all the zombies here? Beth said they also sacrificed a person, Michonne felt incredible, what kind of team is this? Rick took Carl alone to the side, he wanted to comfort his son, after all, he had endured too much and sent his mother off with his own hands, but Carl acted very strong, Rick said if something unexpected happened, lock everyone inside the cell to ensure their safety, Carl nodded and agreed to go down, finally, Carl also gave his sister a name, called Judith, Rick nodded his head and agreed with his son's name, the team also set off, they could not give up Glenn, which is the charm of this team, maybe that's why viewers love Glenn, he's determined not to betray his teammates in the face of severe torture by man, Merle slowly pushed harder, but despite the pain, Glenn still refused to say a word but instead smashed his head against Merle's cheek, Merle smiles instead of being angry, he wants to give Glenn a taste of his own medicine, Maggie was not abused, but she could hear the sound of their abuse of Glenn, take Glenn cannot do anything, Merle directly grabbed a zombie to force, Glenn still flat look at him, Merle was annoyed and let go of the zombie directly, Glenn's hands are tied, when the zombie lunges, he can only use his feet to stomp, and then difficult to reverse the direction, it was hard to stand up, the zombies began to pounce again, Glenn kicked over the table, and again repelled the zombies, Glenn thought of a way to hit the wall with force, trying to break the bench, and finally broke free on the second impact, the zombie bite on Glenn's arm, fortunately his arm, wrapped in tape, Glenn pushed hard, 
then tied to the left hand of the wooden stick directly through the zombie head. Governor is impressed with Glenn, killing the zombie in minutes, while tied up. Merle was also very surprised. It seems that Glenn was outside, fighting for a winter, finally like a man. Governor guesses that Glenn's teammates will come to their rescue but must first figure out their firepower. He was going to start with Maggie, then Governor came to Maggie and took out a dagger. Maggie's heart had a bad pre-capital, but Governor very gentlemanly untied the rope and then sat opposite Maggie. The charming voice said he would send them back and explained that it was just a misunderstanding and that he only needed Maggie to tell Governor where they were. Maggie did not answer and tilted her head to the side, making her attitude clear. Governor saw Maggie even this attitude. He directly ordered Maggie to stand up and then let her take off her clothes or else cut off one of Glenn's hands. Maggie had no choice but to do as she was told. At this point, she had a deep sense of humiliation. Then Governor walked behind Maggie, pressed her to the table, and asked her again to say or not to say. Maggie replied directly that she would not betray her teammates. Governor felt a little underestimated the woman and let go of her because he thought of a better way. Governor took Maggie directly to the place where Glenn was being held. Watching his girlfriend being humiliated in this way, Glenn was incredibly angry, but at this point, there was nothing he could do about it. Governor said the two of them must reveal the location of the camp. Glenn shook his head, perhaps guessing that this would be the case. Governor directly took the gun and put it to Glenn's forehead. Maggie can only say the camp is the prison. Governor's people are not very convinced. There are countless zombies in there, aren't there? Maggie went on to say that they had taken over the prison and now there were 10 men left. They found it incredible that just 10 men had cleared the entire prison of zombies. Governor again put the gun forward a test but did not shoot, but smiled and walked to the door. With a hand on Maggie's face, which is obviously done to Glenn C. See this scene, Glenn's heart vowed to kill this bastard. Maggie also felt endless humiliation, if it wasn't for keeping Glenn alive. She would rather die than tell the prison's location. Looking at Glenn gritting his teeth, Governor felt moody and soothing seemed to be tired of playing. He pushed Maggie to Glenn, let them live for now. Glenn hugged Maggie tightly and swore not to let him escape, or these people would have to pay the price. Governor then discussed with his men. They were a little disbelieved. Ten people cleaned up the prison. Governor analyzed if Maggie lied. They must have a large group of people with heavy weapons living near them. But if Maggie is not lying, this group of people to complete the impossible should also be tough characters. Governor then asked Merle, as they say, blood is thicker than water, and he was curious which side Merle would be on. Merle said firmly that it was Governor's side, but they could not have imagined that Rick and the others already knew that Glenn had been brought to the town by them. While they were discussing, Michonne had already brought Rick and the others to the area. Rick and the others were watching from the back of the car, and two men were on guard. Want to go in quietly is not practical, must be light. There is a problem is that the town is so large, there is no way to know where Glenn is locked up. Immediately afterward, Michonne told the men she had found a way in, and at this time, Governor and Merle were discussing how to attack the prison, he wanted to take out the people in prison, Governor does not allow a second survival camp, and he also tells Merle to send Glenn and Maggie to Cape Terror, the longer they stay alive, maybe the more likely Andrea will find out the truth, and now Andrea is his woman, Glenn, by this time, had already put his clothes on Maggie, and he shuddered as he asked if the scumbag had done anything to her, Maggie immediately replied that no, Governor did not touch her, and then said that for so long, they are running away from zombies, but forget the ugliness of human nature, then, Glenn carefully approached the zombie, then ripped off its arm, he endured severe pain throughout his body and ripped off two bones, in his mind, Rick and others could not know that he was captured, and now only he could save himself, after a while, Merle and his men just came to open the door, two people rushed out, Maggie directly stabbed the man's throat, she now has no mercy on these people, the man pulled the trigger before he died, the gunshots rang out in the town, and Rick, who was feeling his way in, heard them, the rest of the town, too, ran out, Rick also decided to go over to see if they could find them first, Glenn was still fighting with Merle, but he was too badly wounded and was about to have his throat slit when Maggie got her submachine gun and aimed it at Merle, but at this time, the others backed up, Merle also rushed to grab the gun, and thus the two became prisoners again, 
Rick and the others are coming, and there was really someone there, and when they got under the window, they heard Maggie's voice. Just in time for their execution, Rick and Daryl took out flashbangs and smoke bombs and threw them directly at them, catching the men off guard. Rick rushed to the fog and took advantage of the confusion to take Maggie and Glenn, a few people quietly in the night, temporarily hiding in a house. The good thing is that no one here, they did not notice Michonne closed the door and left the place alone. Glenn is so badly injured that he can't even walk. He then tells Daryl that Merle did it, that he tried to kill them, and that he pushed the zombies on him. Daryl incredulously asks if his brother is the governor. Maggie says he looks like he's an adjutant or something and knows Daryl is with them. Immediately afterward, Glenn and Rick said they were sorry he revealed the prison's location to them. They really cannot hold on. Rick said that his brother did not have to say sorry. They would carry anything together. Several people decided to get out of there. Otherwise it will be discovered sooner or later. Daryl threw out two smoke bombs again. And when the smoke filled the air, they quickly rushed out. This time, they ran directly to the fence. The two sides also officially engaged in battle. Andrea came out of the room and saw the smoke and the fire of the shooting and took out a pistol to help. She saw a man fire several shots but did not hit. At this time Governor came out and advised Andrea to leave the place. He did not want her to recognize Rick's people, then called Andrea back to the room first. Rick's men were fighting and retreating. Maggie and Vincent have arrived at the fence. Daryl and Rick are in charge of fire suppression. Vincent stood on the roof of the car, waiting for Glenn. They would be safe when they crossed the fence. At that moment, Rick looked into the distance and froze. Shane came towards them, took out his weapon, and shot directly. Rick has been hallucinating a lot since Lori's death, and it was during his days that Vincent was shot and killed. Rick then reacted and shot him dead, then rushed up to check. What a hallucination on his part. Maggie did not know what Rick was doing, shouted Rick. Rick was, at once, a little more awake, and then also over the roof of the car, to get out of here, but Daryl was pinned down by firepower simply cannot go. In the last episode said, Rick leads the town to rescue Glenn, although they successfully save the two, Vincent is killed. Finally, Daryl attracted all the firepower, and Rick could escape. During this time, Michonne quietly slipped into Governor's room. She always felt there was a secret here. The moment she entered, Michonne was stunned. The Governor had collected so many heads, and the top one was the pilot. It seemed her guess was right. Governor, this person exterminated people a small team, but also, in front of the residents, said that they were going to help them. This time, the cabinet below actually made a sound. Michonne opened it, and she couldn't believe it. This bastard was holding a child captive here. Michonne comforted the child. Do not be afraid. She will get her out. But after taking off the hood, she found that this was a zombie girl. And she will not be merciful to zombies. Governor pleaded with Michonne not to hurt her and said he even threw the pistol aside. Michonne looked at Governor's face and understood that he was the girl's father but could not accept her death. The Governor stepped closer and closer, pleading with his mouth not to hurt his daughter, but... Governor went crazy, screaming and rushing up to cut the woman into pieces. The two just wrestled together. Michonne's knife fell to the ground, and her fighting ability was greatly reduced. But Governor's physical strength was very strong, and he pulled her head and smashed it into the fish tank. Michonne resisted with all her strength and pulled off all the heads. The Governor drags Michonne and tries to get to the zombie's head. Just as Michonne is about to be bitten, she breaks free and goes for her long knife. But soon, Governor grabbed Michonne's neck again. In the nick of time, Michonne ripped off a piece of glass and stuck it directly in Governor's eye, leaving him completely defeated. Michonne also picked up her knife and was about to kill Governor when she felt someone coming from behind her and turned around. Andrea can't believe that her best friend tried to kill her perfect husband. She can't believe that Governor is such a nice person and Michonne can do it. The two have suffered together for more than eight months. So naturally they don't want to worsen their relationship. Michonne put down the knife in her hand and turned around to leave the place. Andrea then went up to check the situation. Governor ignored her but picked up his daughter's body and cried. Andre looked at this man. Incomparable heartache. Do not know how to comfort him. Rick and the others who escaped did not leave because Daryl was still inside. At this time, Michonne also comes here. Rick immediately puts a gun to her head, asks her where she just went and even suspects her of being a spy for the town. Michonne said she helped Rick rescue them. Whether he wanted to take them back to the prison or go in to save them, they needed help. And Michonne could help him. Rick heard and said nothing more. At this point in the town, Governor took care of the wound. He has permanently lost an eye. At this moment, 
the residents of the town gathered and then began to speak up, accused of these terrorist attacks, but also their own eyes, said the sacrifice, and suddenly the crowd was furious. At this time, the governor said that one of them was a terrorist, Merle, and the others immediately looked at him with a fierce faces. Governor went on to say that Merle, his right-hand man and latest partner, had betrayed them tonight and that he had let the terrorist in. Because the terrorist that was caught was Merle's brother, the crowd was in an uproar. Andrea couldn't believe that it was Daryl. The town cried out to kill them, and it must be said that the governor does have a way of playing with people's hearts. And by killing these two men, he became the embodiment of justice again. The surrounding residents were shouting for their execution. Only Andrea rushed out to plead for mercy but was restrained by his men. Governor and Merle said that once he said that the loyalty of the town, now is the time for him to prove it. Kill his brother. Hearing this proposal, the residents also echoed it. Merle also shouted at this moment that he would prove it to them. And with that, he attacked Daryl directly. Daryl fell to the ground and did not fight back. Merle was kicking and kicking without any mercy. As they struggled together, Daryl said that the group would not let Merle go. Merle also whispered to Daryl that they would run away together. With that, the two rolled over and looked at the crowd back to back. Merle is bad. After all, blood is thicker than water, and Daryl is his only family in the world. At this time, Rick and the others had arrived and were throwing smoke bombs. At once, gunshots rang out directly smashing several searchlights. In confusion, Daryl and Merle also fled quickly. Andrea looked at the corpse on the ground. Sad. This was her good friend here, just killed by random gunfire. She could be said to hate this group of terrorists to the extreme. Daryl, on the run, grabbed a man's crossbow and quickly fled the area. Governor watched all this with an expressionless face. He would put to go to them, rake a few people, the door broke open an opening, and then hurriedly left the place. A few zombies also sneaked in. Until the early morning, Glenn and Michonne, waiting by the car, praying for their safe return, they appeared inside the woods. But when they saw Merle, Glenn and Michonne both got excited and wanted to go up and kill the bastard who almost destroyed them. After Daryl and Rick calmed them down, Glenn and Michonne calmed down a bit. Merle was not scared at all but was chattering and mocking in the back, saying one vulgar word after another. Rick could not stand it and knocked him out because he was Daryl's brother so he could live so long. Then several people come together to discuss the stay of these two people. For Michonne, Rick thinks she is an unstable factor. When she is healed, let her leave. As for Merle, everyone disagrees that he should go to prison. It is a rat turd and even threatens the family's safety. It's just that Daryl can't let his brother stay outside. Glenn said he is his brother, but his family is them and the people waiting in prison. Rick also said that Daryl was part of their family, but Merle was not and he would endanger everyone. In the end, Daryl decided to with his brother, and he understood the feelings of the guys. Both sides are family. He was also very difficult. Daryl told the guys to tell Carol. He believes she will understand. Good brother gone. They are very sad. But this is no way things. The day must go on as usual. They must return to prison. There may be a big fight next. And during this time, the prison also happened some things. The five survivors scurried through the woods. The big man opened a path in front of them. The wife who ran at the end was bitten by a zombie on the arm. Her husband and son then turned back. The man rushed up and fought off the zombies, which saved his wife. Finally, they ran to the abandoned building. The people decided to go inside to hide. In the outside could not hold on. At night, in prison, Rick and other people go out to rescue Glenn has not yet returned. Carl, who stays behind a few people, suddenly hears that there is some movement in the depths of the prison. Carl then took a flashlight to check the depths of the passageway. He remembered his father's advice to manage this place well. And when he came to the depths, he heard the sound of someone talking. Carl walked in and saw that several strangers were killing zombies. Seeing that the woman could not hold on, he shot directly. This is when several people saw this little guy. Now the situation is urgent. They no longer dawdle quickly into the passage and finally to the cell. The big guy put the woman down, and her husband rushed over to check. Unfortunately, she was dead. Carl said flatly, leave it to me, or she will soon turn into a zombie. The woman was curious. Who was this child? Is was there anyone else here? Carl said again, listen, they will help them but they, first, have to solve this, the big guy named Tyrese. He said they'd do it themselves, just when Tyrese was about to do it. The woman's husband, Alan, was very reluctant. Now here to play affection, when escaped, he was the fastest runner. After dealing with the woman, Carl locked the cell door, 
he would not let these people in. Tyrese's sister Sasha was a little emotional. What happened to lock them in here? Carl said he couldn't let them in but would give them food and water. Sasha didn't buy it and was screaming at them to open the door. Tyrese rushed over to her sister to calm her down. They had saved them. And look at this place. It was the best conditions they had had in weeks. And it was their territory. The next day, Carl gave them food. And Herschel treated Alan's injuries. Sasha saw that there was a baby here and loved it. It's not easy to see children in the post-apocalyptic world. Tyrese told them where they came from. They had been wandering for two months and wanted to stay in prison, but Herschel said he didn't have a say here. Then turned around and went into the cell. The four understood that they would have to wait for their leader's return to decide. By noon, the men were ready to bury the bodies of their companions, but Alan had other ideas and told Tyrese to put the bodies down first. Then walk forward, observing the prison and then said this was a perfect opportunity, there is only a child and woman at the door, pretend to let them help, take the opportunity to seize the weapons, and take them directly by surprise, Tyrese said angrily, they are good people, just save them, and he are going to kill them, there is a baby among them, only an animal would do such a thing, Alan and his son were talking about how this is the law of survival in the end times, at this time, Beth and Lou kindly found shovels for them. Alan and his son looked at each other and walked over to them. Tyrese and Sasha immediately got ahead of them, took the tools, and thanked them. It was noon when Rick and the others finally returned to the prison, and Carl was relieved to see that his dad was okay. Carol was looking for Daryl and found he hadn't returned, so she was a little anxious. Rick rushed to comfort Carol. Daryl was still alive. He found his brother, so he would not come back with them. Carol was a little sad. Could she never see Daryl again? Daryl had done everything for Sophia. Carol had already treated him as a family member. Looking at Maggie and Glenn safely back, Herschel finally put his heart down. Rick came to the cell and did not go to see the few outsiders but to see his daughter's condition. Back Glenn also has a big change in temperament. No longer the usual cheerful smile. He looks at Maggie's eyes full of grief and anger and does not know what to say. Because Glenn thinks Maggie must have been defiled by Governor. All he can think about is revenge. Afterward, Herschel treated Michonne and found that the woman probably hadn't slept for days. Rick didn't trust Michonne too much and just wanted her to get well and leave. The next few people met together. The situation is not optimistic now. Daryl also left the place. Governor would certainly not swallow this. The prison side of the fighting force was too small. And guns and ammunition were also low. Herschel suggested that perhaps a few outsiders could join. Rick did not speak but came outside. Tyrese politely extended his hand. But Rick didn't bother with him. Instead asking how they got in, Tyrese explained. And Carl was beside himself. Say that they had gotten lost in the passage. Rick obviously freaked them out. Tyrese said. Listening to Herschel said they need help. Killing zombies they are no stranger to. Food they also look for themselves. As long as they are given a place to stay. If someone attacks them, they will also help. Rick looked at it for two seconds and said two words. No. Sasha also pleaded on the side. But Rick still refused. He did not want to lose his teammates because of trusting strangers. Herschel several people completely trusted Rick. No matter what he decided to do. Herschel called Rick aside. Then said in a serious tone. Rick has done a lot for them. He saved their lives. And everyone is grateful. Whatever he says. They do. But he is now wrong. He has to learn to give others a chance to survive. Rick echoed Herschel's last sentence in his mind. Thinking that he was indeed too sensitive. When he was about to agree, Rick saw a figure on the second floor. It was Lori. Rick was hallucinating again. His emotions started to break down, and he even pulled out a pistol, Tyrese. A few people were scared and rushed out of the place. Even teammates are a little scared. The next morning, Rick took the binoculars and searched for. Finally, Rick saw Lori again. She was at the cemetery. He rushed down the stairs. By the time Rick got here, Lori's figure had disappeared again. Rick looked around and finally saw Lori outside the fence again. Then ran outside, scaring Michonne to get her weapon on guard. Rick came to the wooden bridge. Lori stroked his face. And the way Rick looked into the air was all in Michonne's eyes. And she knew there was something mentally wrong with this Rick guy. Now that Daryl is gone and Rick is crazy, Glenn has temporarily taken over as the leader, and he thinks should turn defense into offense and just sneak in and take out Governor. Glenn wants Michonne to go with them. Glenn is too eager to kill the bastard Governor. Herschel thinks that now cannot be impulsive. They can get out of here. Glenn was already overwhelmed by hatred and drove the car to the town. Even though Maggie had told him that Governor didn't do anything to her. But Glenn didn't think so. And that's why he was so extreme. Herschel sighed and then looked at Rick wandering outside. 
He doesn't want the team to disband. He had to do something about it. Herschel went to the fence on crutches and then called Rick back. Now Glenn is angry and out of his mind. He's smart but hardly a leader. Governor could come at any moment and now is when everyone needs Rick. But Rick doesn't want to care. Herschel knows he's insane and asks Rick what he's looking for. Rick sadly says that he found Lori. And although he knows it's a hallucination, there must be a reason for her presence. After saying that, he walked towards the woods again. Carol and the others also came to the courtyard. Lou and she discussed Rick's situation. A second ago, Lou, still talking and laughing, was just killed. And the people rushed to be on guard. Michonne is in the back of the car to see. But it would be governor-led people here. Rick heard the gunshots and was about to return. Rick immediately became alert when he heard gunshots. But he was soon under fire. Carol pulled Lou's body over to block the bullets that were coming towards them. Carl and Beth quickly found a place to take cover. A group of people didn't know when they had already taken over the watchtower. Michonne discovered that the person was the governor and didn't hesitate to shoot at him. The governor was even more angry when he saw Michonne as she was the one who killed his daughter. Rick finally noticed the person shooting at him. But he didn't hit them. He could only hide in the crevice. The governor's side seemed to have an endless supply of bullets and they were shooting wildly at the prison, even firing a few shots into the sky. Maggie also rushed out with her gun. In terms of numbers, the two sides were evenly matched, but the other side had the advantage of initiative and geography. Maggie ran to a barrier and found the person on the watchtower. Firing wildly, Carol ran to the wall with Maggie's cover. Both sides were at a stalemate for a while. A few minutes later, the scene suddenly quieted down. The governor's mouth curved into a smile. He had brought a gift for the prison. A car came speeding down the road, crashing through the prison gate and stopping in the courtyard. Herschel didn't know what they wanted to do. Just as everyone was wondering, the car door opened and countless zombies walked out. The driver shot at Michonne a few times before quickly leaving. Rick was about to shoot the driver, but his gun was out of bullets. Immediately. Rick was under a crazy barrage of fire. The two sides started shooting again. Maggie took a deep breath, then calmly aimed and killed the enemy on the watchtower. Everyone relaxed. The governor didn't expect to destroy these people today. There wouldn't be any results even if they continued fighting as they didn't have the numerical advantage. He only came to give them a warning and the storm was still to come. Governor just left Glenn and came back. But it wasn't time to pursue them. The safety of their family was the most important thing. Maggie and her team also quickly came out to kill the zombies. Herschel was still in the grass. Michonne also pulled out her sword and rushed up to rescue Herschel, basically killing one zombie with each strike. Fortunately, Glenn also drove the car here and they quickly helped Herschel onto the car. They successfully got rid of the zombies with some close calls and made it back to the prison. Meanwhile, Rick was tackled by two zombies with no bullets left in his pistol. At that moment, an arrow pierced through the zombie's head. It was obvious that Daryl had come back. Even Merle shouted and rushed over, with the three of them working together. They quickly cleared out the zombies. Rick and Daryl nodded at each other, without saying too much. Looking at the zombies in the courtyard, Rick fell into silence. Later, the group discussed what to do next in the prison cell. Herschel believed they had to leave and not wait for death. Rick insisted on staying, and Glenn supported his idea. However, Merle mocked Say and said he knew the governor too well. If they had slipped out last night, they could have lived a few more days. But now they had no chance. There were definitely governor's men everywhere outside. And breaking through the prison fence was just his first step. Even if they had a strong fortress, they couldn't compete with governor's weapons and troops. They might even starve Rick and his group to death here. Herschel spoke up and suggested they leave to avoid more casualties. Rick didn't say anything and turned around to leave again to find Lori. Herschel walked up to him and said, Rick, your condition is getting worse and everyone can see it. But now not the time. When Rick told them not to be democratic, now he must step up and lead them. Everyone's lives are in him hands. So, pull yourself together and take action. Rick, feeling frustrated went to the back door balcony and looked into the distance with a telescope. It's unclear whether he was looking for snipers or searching for Lori. At that moment, Carl came up behind Rick and asked him not to be angry. He suggested that Rick was not fit to lead them now, and Glenn or Daryl should take over. He needed to rest. This woke Rick up. Carl was right. He needed to protect Carl, Judith, and everyone else. After sobering up, Rick began to pull himself together and he rejoined the team. The courtyard was filled with zombies, and there were likely governor's people lurking around. Food would soon run out, and the situation was grim. They needed to come up with a plan to survive. Meanwhile, in the town, Andrea found governor and questioned him about why he went back on his word. 
He clearly promised her that she would not retaliate against Rick and the others. Governor hypocritically claimed that he went to negotiate. But Rick and his group started shooting at them. Andrea's friends have changed. They are now a bunch of murderous devils. Andrea, once again, believed him and got angry, saying that Governor always kept things from her. She couldn't watch her friends and the people in the town fight each other. Immediately afterwards, Andrea requested to go to the prison to reconcile the matter, but Governor refused on the grounds that the road was impassable. Frustrated, Andrea went to the street and found Governor's men transporting weapons and even conscripting young residents, including a 14-year-old child, to join the army. Unable to stop Governor, Andrea attempted to leave through the main gate, only to find it locked. Finally, Andrea found the town scientist Milton, who is also one of Governor's cronies, but he is very kind. Andrea asks Milton to take her out because he studies zombies can take people out, and only when she gets to the prison can she find Rick to talk to avoid losing both. In the afternoon, Milton brought Andrea out and helped her catch a zombie to clear the way. They ran into Tyrese and his group, who were leaving the prison. Tyrese and his group were excited to hear about the town and asked if they were still accepting new members. Milton nodded and let Andrea go alone while he took Tyrese's group back to the town. Andrea walked for a while until she finally arrived at the prison. Carl, who was on patrol, noticed her and informed Rick. Maggie used binoculars to confirm that it was Andrea. As Andrea got closer, pushing a zombie with her, she entered the yard. This method can briefly hide from other zombies. Rick and his group were on high alert believing it could be another of Governor's schemes. Even Carl prepared his sniper rifle from a high vantage point. They were ready for whatever was coming their way. Rick and his group looked around for any ambush before running towards the door. He asked if Andrea was the only one there. Andrea doesn't have the heart to answer this. Urging Rick to open the door, she had been outside for too long, and they would soon be surrounded by zombies. Once inside, Andrea did not receive a warm welcome from her old friends. Instead, she was asked to turn around. After all, the position is different now, and nothing can be taken lightly at any time. After not finding anything, Rick a serious tone and said, Welcome back. After coming to the cell, Andrea observed their living conditions. It had been too long since they saw each other. Carol is also alive. Both of them are very excited. After all, at first Andrea to save her to get separated. Then Andrea saw Herschel's missing leg and wondered what had happened. She looked around and asked why Shane and Lori weren't there. Rick shook his head gloomily, and the answer was apparent. It turned out that their old friends were not doing well, and T-Dog had also died. Andrea wanted to go into their cell block to see them, but Rick stopped her. He explained that the square and yard were initially safe until Andrea's boyfriend made people destroy the fence and shooting at them. Andrea was confused because Governor said that Rick and his group started shooting first. Rick said that was Governor's lie, and Andrea believed it. Herschel added that Governor also killed one of their surviving prisoners. Andrea apologized to everyone, indicating that she had no idea about any of this. She only found out a few days ago that Rick and his group attacked the town. Then Andrea turned to Michonne and asked what she told them to make them so indifferent. They used to be mutual friends, but now they are so ostracized. After composing herself, Andrea continued, saying that she could not excuse or explain Governor's actions. However, she came here to resolve the impasse and reconcile their differences. Rick immediately became angry, saying that there were no differences. They would kill Governor, although they didn't know how or when they would do it. But they would do it. Andrea sighed, wondering why they couldn't coexist peacefully. The town welcomed them to settle down. Even Merle laughed at this statement. Andrea continued, saying that the town now had many people and was training an army to prepare for war. Daryl angrily said told Andrea to go back and tell Governor that he wanted his other eye. Glenn is even more furious. If want to start a war, come on. Finally, Andrea was deeply saddened by her former teammates became so bloodthirsty. After a while, Andrea came out alone to talk to Michonne. She believed that Michonne had misled everyone into hating the town just because she didn't choose to leave together. Andrea also blamed Michonne for entering the town with hostility from the start. Michonne argued back, saying that she saw their true nature, while Andrea was enchanted by Governor from the moment she saw him. Andrea couldn't admit it and instead said that she stayed to help the town's residents and was now trying to save Rick and his group. Michonne laughed. She didn't know that Bastard's Messiah complex was still contagious. Then Michonne told Andrea that Governor had sent four people to chase after her when she left. If Andrea had gone with her, Governor would have killed her too. Michonne questions Andrea, knowing that the pilot's squad was wiped out by Governor. Knowing what he did to Glenn and Maggie, 
she abandoning her friends for the comfort of Governor Bed, Michonne angrily told Andrea to go back to her saintly man. Andrea was stunned, how could the truth be like this? Was Governor really that kind of person? Despite everyone's cold treatment of Andrea, they still saw her as a friend. Before leaving, Andrea hugged Judith. Carol gave Andrea some advice. She said that she slept with Governor, and when he fell asleep, she could end it all. Andrea fell into silence. A few minutes later, her friends prepared a car for Andrea and gave her a knife for self-defense. Even though they were running low on ammunition, they still gave her a gun. This team has a family feeling that is not found anywhere else. Andrea left the prison with a heavy heart and drove until nightfall to reach the town. Now there were many people on duty on the wall, including the children who had joined the army during the day. They recognized Andrea but didn't give her a hard time because she was governor's woman. After returning to her room, Andrea confessed that she had gone to the prison, but it wasn't a betrayal. She just wanted to ease the tension between the two sides. Governor didn't pursue the matter. That night, Andrea picked up the knife and slowly walked towards Governor while he slept. But in the end, she couldn't bring herself to do it. The people in the prison also couldn't sleep. Knowing that this war would be fought sooner or later, Rick decided to go out tomorrow and return to the old police station to see if he could find some guns and ammunition, compared to the warmth and comfort of a small town. The days of the prison seemed sad and quiet. How would the conflict between the two sides be resolved? The survivor on the highway kept waving, just hoping that the person driving would help him. Rick's mood remained unchanged. Unknowingly, the heart of this upright police officer had also become indifferent. Now he only showed tenderness to the people around him. Returning to the topic, the three of them soon arrived at the small town where Rick used to live. The purpose of this trip was to find guns and ammunition to fight against Governor. When they arrived on the street, they were shocked. The place was full of sharpened bamboo, made into various traps to block the way. It was obvious that it was used to deal with the zombies, and someone had already occupied the place. Rick couldn't retreat. He used to be the town's police officer, and he knew who had guns in their homes. He hoped to get lucky and find some. At this moment, a zombie followed them and bumped into a rope, making a clanging sound. Immediately afterwards, a heavily armed man with a gun shouted for Rick to put his hands up and drop what he was holding and leave the area, including the knife they were holding. Giving them 10 seconds, Rick let Carl hear the signal and ran towards the back of the car. The man had already started the countdown. When he counted to six, Rick shouted for Carl to run. The three of them were now very safe behind the obstacles. Rick loaded his gun and prepared to counterattack, but the man had disappeared. Michonne also arrived at the top floor. The man appeared on the first floor, walking and shooting, completely focused on Rick. Rick hid behind the barrel has no way to escape, is about to surprise the sneak attack, hiding in the side of Carl shot directly down the man. Even Michonne was surprised by this little guy. However, Carl was still criticized and educated by Rick, and was told that in the next dangerous situation, he could only hide. Rick knocked on the man's back, clearly wearing a bulletproof vest. When he lifted it, he found that the bullet had not gone through, and the man had probably passed out from the pain. When Rick took off his mask, he was shocked. It was Morgan. Rick can't leave him alone. Without Morgan, he would have died long ago. Now, he could only carry him upstairs first. When they entered the room, they were surprised to find so many weapons. Even the police station didn't have so many. How many places had Morgan searched? With that, he was placed on the bed. Michonne and Carl quickly packed the weapons. Rick noticed that even under the bed were guns. Then he was attracted by the words on the wall. Two prominent red letters. Then there are all kinds of strange words. What had happened to Morgan? There was no time to think about it. Pick some weapons to take away first. When Rick picked up a gun, he found the walkie-talkie he had given to Morgan. He promised to contact Morgan every morning, but he forgot about it during the escape. Then Rick saw the words on the wall, saying that Dwayne had turned into a zombie. He couldn't believe that Morgan's son had died. What a blow it must have been for him. Rick was worried about Morgan's condition and decided to wait for him to wake up here. Michonne and Carl strongly opposed it. Morgan had almost killed them just now. It's already considered lucky for him that they didn't leave him downstairs. They didn't understand the significance of Morgan to Rick. After some thought, Rick decided to tie up Morgan's hands since he was clearly mentally unstable. Carl and his father offered to look for supplies. There was a baby store downstairs that his mother's friend used to run, and he wanted to find baby supplies for his sister. Michonne decided to accompany Carl on his search, and Rick eventually agreed. After a while, Rick picked up a sniper rifle that he had given to Morgan before. As he was examining it, Morgan suddenly pounced on him. 
Rick instinctively knocked him down. Rick repeatedly asked Morgan if he knew who he was and if he recognized him. Morgan shouted that Rick was a devil with a human face and then lunged at him with a knife. Rick tried to resist while also attempting to awaken Morgan. Morgan's strength was too great, and he easily knocked Rick to the ground, yelling that Rick was not human and that he wanted to kill him. The knife plunged directly into Rick's shoulder. Rick fought back without holding back taking out his gun and cursing while pointing it at Morgan's head. To Rick's surprise, Morgan begged him to pull the trigger and kill him. When Morgan calmed down, Rick put away his gun. Morgan cried uncontrollably, and to prevent him from causing any more trouble, Rick had to tie him to a table. Morgan kept pleading with Rick to kill him. Rick picked up the walkie-talkie and told Morgan that he had given it to him and promised to contact him every morning so that Morgan could find him. Upon hearing this, Morgan finally remembered Rick's name and apologized for stabbing him. Morgan continued, saying that he and his son sat on the roof and called out for Rick every day for several weeks. But then it was just him. There is always noise on the walkie-talkie. Rick said he would contact them, but he didn't, and Morgan's emotions flared up as he spoke as if blaming Rick for not contacting them and giving them this hope. Rick could only say that they were forced to flee and had to keep moving further away. He found his wife and son. Morgan blames Rick, but he actually running away from reality. Rick had given Morgan many guns, and he had tried to kill his zombified wife, but could not bear to do it. In the end, tragedy struck when they were looking for supplies, and his wife attacked their son. If Morgan had killed his wife, their son would still be alive. With guilt and sadness Morgan becomes eccentric. As Rick listened to Morgan's story, he could feel his despair. He was also a father. After a while, both of them calmed down, and Rick told Morgan that they could get through this together. But Morgan's mental state was pessimistic, and he didn't want to go anywhere. In the end, the three of them left with some of the guns. Before they left, Rick looked back with deep helplessness. He didn't know how to help Morgan, and his own life was a mess. While they were packing up, Carl told his father that Michonne was a good person and that they should let her stay. He had enjoyed spending time with her while they were looking for supplies. Thanks to Carl's words, Rick agreed to let Michonne stay when they returned to the cell. Glenn was in charge of organizing the guns. They couldn't imagine how Rick had found so many weapons. After a while, Maggie found Glenn on duty, and they were finally able to have a good conversation. Taking this opportunity, Glenn apologizes to Maggie who only thinks of himself during this time. Maggie needs space, and he is being aggressive. Maggie responded that they didn't need space between them. She just wanted Glenn to know that she would always be there for him. Finally, the small couple reconciled. At this moment, Rick and his group were not in prison. They received an invitation from Andrea to come to the farm for peace negotiations. Rick took a strong stance and proposed that the town should own the land west of the river, and the prison should own the land to the east, with clear boundaries to avoid conflict. However, the governor refused this proposal. With that, governor let Andrea out. Rick thought governor wanted the prison place. Governor laughed. He didn't want prison. What he wanted was Michonne for. Rick was silent because he did not know what Michonne had done. The governor gave Rick two days to consider his proposal and left. Back at the prison, Rick told his group that the governor wanted to destroy them because they destroyed his town. Rick was conflicted about whether to give up Michonne for their safety. Herschel comforted Rick and reminded him that they were family and had to stick together no matter what. And governor returned to the town. He immediately instructed his men. Two days later in the negotiation site to ambush the gunman. Once they see Rick and Michonne brought over, immediately open fire to kill the others. Milton was confused by the governor's plan and hoped for peace. Governor smiled. By then the main force of the prison will come. They want to take out this group of people to eliminate forever. Andrea was unaware of the governor's plan and was pleased with the negotiations. In the evening, the governor came to his secret base, already ready to torture Michonne props. Just imagine the excitement of the scene. The next day, Milton found that the self-defense forces were carrying heavy weapons and were supposedly preparing to ambush the prison. Milton tried to persuade the governor to stop using violence, but his efforts were in vain. Milton told Andrea about the governor's plan to kill Michonne and everyone at the prison. Milton then took Andrea to the governor's secret base. A chair prepared for Michonne. This pervert wanted Michonne to feel the pain of losing her eyes too. Andrea realized she had made a mistake and decided to kill the governor. However, Milton stopped her and explained that killing the governor would not solve anything. He suggests that she go and inform Rick and his team to escape. Andrea drew her gun in anger and got out of there. Andrea did not understand why Milton protected the governor. 
Milton explained that if Andrea killed the governor, she would not be able to leave the town alive. The governor's men would not spare anyone at the prison. The only option was to inform Rick and his team. Andrea understood and left to warn them. She said goodbye to Milton. Andrea rushed out onto the street, ready to slip away at any moment, but she was stopped by the town's militia. The governor had decreed that all residents must surrender their weapons, so Andrea reluctantly handed over the weapons Rick had given her. While the militia was collecting the weapons, Andrea quickly made her way to the gate, where she was confronted by Tyrese and his sister. Seeing that the two wanted to ask a clear question, she directly took out the dagger. Tyrese said they didn't need to hurt each other. Andrea thinks that Tyrese's siblings are good people. Explained that she needed to leave and that the governor was not what he seemed. Sasha was confused. As she found the governor to be very charming and trustworthy, Andrea directly retorted that she thought so at first, but governor had done countless despicable things. She had to get out of here and let the Tyrese siblings go, too. And the two did not stop and let her leave. Andrea ran straight away, and if governor had found out, he would have gone after her. After a while, Tyrese and his sister were called to the warehouse and the governor asked them why they had let Andrea go. Tyrese replied that they couldn't just kill Andrea and that they were there to keep the zombies out and not to prevent people from going out. The governor pretends to be concerned about Andrea, saying that he was worried about her being outside alone and putting herself in danger. He seemed very sincere and convincing. Tyrese and his sister did not reveal what Andrea had told them and said they didn't know the reason for her departure. After the governor left, Milton immediately went to talk to him and suggested that he let Andrea go and be with her friends at the prison. However, when Milton mentioned that Andrea only wanted to be with her friends, the governor realized that Milton had told Andrea about his plans and became furious. He realized that if Andrea made it to the prison, all of his plans would be for nothing. Governor plans to go after Andrea himself. Andrea left the town and ran wildly, but soon there were cars driving. Must be to chase her. I do not know how long it took to get rid of a lot of zombies and finally came to the prison. Andrea saw Rick on the watchtower and excitedly raised her hand to get his attention, but Rick only glanced briefly and did not notice her. He took a closer look with his binoculars but saw nothing out of the ordinary, thinking that he was hallucinating again. In the last episode, Andrea gave up her handsome boyfriend and decided to go back to the prison to warn Rick. However, she was ambushed by the governor just as she arrived at the prison gate. Meanwhile, the governor's men went to a pit where they collected zombies. When Tyrese learned that these zombies were meant to be used against the people in the prison, he and his sister immediately spoke out against it. There were elderly people and babies in the prison, and they were all good people. Tyrese told Alan that they refused to do this and they could just leave the town if necessary. However, Alan refused to do so and was willing to do anything to stay. Tyrese and Alan had a disagreement about this and they ended up fighting each other. Sasha discouraged they. Late at night, a car arrives. A mysterious person poured gasoline on the zombies in the car and burned them all, then drove away. The next day, the self-defense team came to the pit to check, but all they found was the residual black smoke and stench. The zombies had already been burned to ashes. Tyrese was the main suspect in this incident since he openly opposed the plan during the day. The governor was extremely hypocritical and always appeared polite in front of others. Tyrese said he didn't care about the governor's feud with Rick, but he couldn't let Rick's child be fed to the zombies. The governor immediately denied this and said that nobody was feeding anyone to the zombies. They were just trying to scare them away, and he would rather save more lives than use violence. The governor's attitude and tone were particularly sincere. Tyrese and his sister were not suspicious and immediately apologized to the governor, saying that they shouldn't have questioned him. They also stated that they really wanted to stay and wouldn't act impulsively again. The governor was very satisfied and left. Before leaving, he asked Tyrese and his sister where they got the gasoline. They were both puzzled, and the governor knew from their reaction that they were not the ones who burned the zombies. When he left, he was already thinking about whether there was a traitor in the town. Milton found the governor and asked if Andrea was still alive. The governor said she might still be alive he hadn't found her yet. Milton then mentioned the burnt zombies and said it was a pity. He hoped the governor could find out who did it. Milton, a kind-hearted man, asked the question, the but his expression was extremely unnatural. The governor, being a shrewd person, already had an answer in his heart. Meanwhile, Rick has decided to trade Michonne in exchange for safe passage out of the prison. He needed Daryl's help to do this, but Daryl was reluctant since they were not that kind of people. However, this was Rick's decision, and he didn't have a choice but to comply to avoid casualties. Rick also needed someone else to help him, and that person was Merle. No one was more suitable than him to do this dirty work. 
Merle was a bit surprised that Rick would go for such a thing, but he calmly explained that he had followed the governor before and killing was always done by smashing their brains or slitting their throats to avoid wasting bullets. However, he knew that this was just an excuse for the governor's bloodlust. If Rick handed over Michonne to the governor, the governor wouldn't kill her but would torture her instead. He might even gouge out one or both of her eyes. Was Rick willing to let this happen for a faint promise? Merle felt a twinge of sadness for the once friendly cop who had become so cold and ruthless. Merle wasn't opposed to the plan, but he knew Rick well enough to know that he didn't have the courage to carry it out. Rick didn't wait for Merle to finish. Rick interrupted and said they had to hand over Michonne to the governor before noon. At that moment, Rick heard a commotion outside and quickly grabbed his gun and went to investigate. Fortunately, there was no sudden attack. Carl and the others were outside the fence luring zombies, and Maggie was also involved. They worked with each other and placed a barbed wire in the middle of the road. Rick watched as everyone worked so hard to prepare for war, especially Michonne who was also actively involved. When the car returned, he ran over and opened the door. Glenn said that if the governor attacked, the spike strips would come in handy. Daryl quickly added that it was Michonne's idea. Michonne also spoke up and said they didn't have to defeat them, just show them that attacking them would be more than worth it. Rick was a little shaken after hearing and looked at everyone working together to defend their home. He and Daryl exchanged a glance, and Daryl naturally hoped that Rick would change his mind. Merle watched from upstairs and understood that Rick's group would definitely change their minds and not do such a thing. And so it is. Rick went to the corner of the prison and found a network cable which he planned to use to tie Michonne's hands. She probably wouldn't be able to break free from it. Rick struggled with his decision for a long time and then looked up to see Lori again, as if reminding him not to make a mistake. In the end, Rick decided to follow his heart, threw the rope away, and quickly left the area. When he got back to the cell, Herschel stopped him. Then Rick found Daryl and told him the plan was cancelled. They were going to face the governor head on. Daryl was relieved because he would support Rick, but that didn't mean he was willing to do it. No matter how much the world changed, he had his own bottom line and principles. But Rick said he couldn't find Merle and Michonne. They're gone. Daryl felt uneasy, and they eventually found some traces on the ground. It seemed that Merle had taken Michonne. Daryl volunteered to go after them. Rick needs to stay and run the show. Merle was on his way to the trade. Knowing full well that Rick was the type of person who would change his mind, he was well suited for the dirty work and he wasn't particularly concerned about the prison's well-being. But Daryl saw the prison as home, which was why he ambushed Michonne and took her to meet with the governor. After a while, Merle found himself in a village and found a usable car. This can be much faster now. On the way, Michonne didn't resist much and instead tried to persuade Merle to turn back and be with his brother. They might not make it back if they continued on this path. Merle understood this. How could he not know what governor was? But he couldn't go back now. He and the prison group weren't on the same side, and everyone saw him as a demon. Eventually, Merle stopped the car and cut Michonne's ropes, telling her to go back and prepare for battle. He then left the area in the car, perhaps the first time he had ever done something good-hearted. Finally, the car stopped in front of a bar, and Merle turned the music up to attract the attention of countless zombies. His plan was to go to the trade location alone. Merle arrived at the farm with the zombies and found an opportunity to jump out of the car. He was familiar with the terrain and hid in a room. The governor's men who were lying in wait heard the music and ran towards it. Not Rick. It's in with bunch of zombies. While they were shooting, Merle took advantage of the chaos and shot and killed two men who were alone. The scene was too chaotic. And Merle switched windows constantly. Shooting at the self-defense team, he aimed at the governor and fired, but accidentally hit someone else. A zombie appeared next to Merle, and he had to deal with it. During the struggle, he accidentally pushed it out the door, and he was met with a severe beating. The governor was furious. Not only was this guy a traitor, but he was also now ruining his plan. After a severe beating, Merle was killed by the governor. Rick gathered everyone and confessed to the plan to trade Michonne. He said that he had intended to do it, but he changed his mind. Merle had already taken Michonne, and they didn't know if Daryl could catch up and stop them. Rick apologized for not telling everyone about this. After the destruction of the farm last year, Rick had said that he could only be a dictator, but now he realized that this was inhumane, despite the changes in the world. But there are still some bottom lines that must be followed from now on. They would decide together on what to do. No one else could be sacrificed for the greater good. They were all part of the bigger picture. They themselves are the reason for living. They could either choose to leave and escape or choose to stay and fight. They had to be united. The group voted on the next decision, and no matter what the outcome was, they were a family and could fight or run together. After Rick spoke, 
He left to give everyone time to think. When he arrived at the watchtower, Michonne had returned, but Daryl was nowhere to be found. Meanwhile, Daryl had arrived at the trade location. It was littered with zombie and human corpses, and the governor's people had already left. But he saw something that made him stop in his tracks. Merle's ambush had made the governor furious, and he took out his anger on Milton. The person he hated the most now was anyone who went against him. Milton had finally seen Andrea, who had been locked up by the governor. The governor ordered Milton to bring him his tools, and he had no choice but to comply. Due to his injuries, he accidentally dropped one of the tools on the ground. He had to kneel down to pick it up, and when he picked up the last pair of pliers, he froze for a couple of seconds. The angle was just right where the governor couldn't see it. Milton hoped that it could help Andrea, and when he took it out, the governor suddenly had a new idea. He grabbed Milton and ordered him to use the knife to kill Andrea, to show where his loyalty stood. Milton had no choice but to comply, otherwise, they would both die. He slowly approached Andrea, but suddenly turned around and stabbed the governor instead. The governor had already been prepared and killed Milton in retaliation. He then locked the door and made Andrea watch as he had Milton turned into a zombie and eat her. Meanwhile, back at the prison, everyone was packing up and preparing to leave. Daryl had returned and was shocked to learn that his brother had done something good before his death. He didn't have time to mourn, though. As he had to protect his family, Rick apologized to Michonne for almost agreeing to hand her over to the governor. Michonne understood and said that she had a good intuition, which is why she chose to leave the town and come to the prison. As Rick and the others were packing up, the governor was rallying his troops, shouting that these criminals had killed 13 of their people. He claimed that they were no different from the zombies and that they had to defend their home. Today, they would finally settle the score. Tyrese interrupted the governor and said that they had decided not to participate in this fight. This was not their war, and they only fought against the zombies. Not innocent people, Tyrese would stay behind to protect the children, and they wouldn't mind leaving if they were asked to. The governor was seething with anger, but he didn't show it. He didn't want to ruin his image in front of the townspeople. He handed Tyrese a sniper rifle and asked him to protect the place well. The governor's convoy arrived at the prison with four cars and over ten people. This time, he didn't want to play games with Rick and went straight in with all his firepower, intending to crush them. Before they could enter the prison, the machine guns on the roof of the car began to sweep the sentry towers in front of them, snuffing out any sneak attacks, and several cars soon came to a halt. Everyone in the cars had weapons and began shooting, not only at the prison but also at any zombies that got in their way. However, so far, there had been no sign of any resistance. The group stormed into the prison, which was just as quiet and empty as the outside. Alan had been to the prison before and knew the layout, so he led the group inside. When they came inside, it was equally empty. Governor was puzzled. Had they already escaped? He immediately ordered his men to split up and search. However, as they made their way through the corridors, someone threw several flash and smoke grenades from an unknown location, causing chaos among the group. Governor shouted for them to remain calm, but nobody listened. To make matters worse, there were zombies inside as well. Since the people who joined the army were originally ordinary citizens, they panicked when surrounded by zombies and quickly fled the scene. Glenn was already lying in ambush on the second floor corridor and started shooting at anyone he saw, while Maggie intercepted them on the other side. This was Rick and the group's plan, to let the non-combatants hide in the forest while the others lay in wait inside the prison. They didn't need to eliminate everyone, just so they know there's a price to pay for coming here. Self-defense forces flee in disarray, forgetting why they had come in the first place and fearing getting hit by bullets. When Rick they saw the retreating team, the battle was easier than they had imagined. Even Rick and the others didn't need to make an appearance, the group was so scared that they fled. And they had one. Rick and the others thought that the governor would not stop fighting, so it was best to pursue them and not let everyone live in fear and worry. However, while driving away, Governor ordered his men to pull over. As soon as he got out of the car, he started to curse loudly. How could so many people be scared away by just two people? The residents had already realized that this was not self-defense as Governor had claimed, but rather a massacre. Some of them began to shout, listening to these harsh words. Governor's face slowly became twisted, and he started shooting with the rifle in his hand. Thought he was just going to kill two men to establish his authority, but didn't expect the governor to fire wildly and kill them both. He went on a killing spree, and both of his followers were scared. Governor had eliminated these people, and the world was finally quiet. All that remains is Alan, who, somewhat alarmed, pointed his gun at Governor. For such a character, Governor calmly pulled out his pistol, already expecting Alan to be afraid to shoot. The two subordinates were a little scared, 
Governor didn't do anything to them, but went to the people he had just killed to check if they were alive. Woolman was also incredibly nervous at the moment, having just been pinned down by the corpses and escaping with her life. And it was only after Governor had fired one shot and had no more the bullet was gone, so he took his two men and left. Andrea was still trying to pick up the tweezers with her foot, but she was also keeping an eye on Milton's body, fearing that he would turn into a zombie. This time, the tweezers were successfully picked up and slowly passed towards her hand. Andrea exhaling for fear of waking Milton up, after a few minutes, she finally got the tweezers into her hand. At that moment, Milton's hand responded. Rick and the others had also arrived on the road and found the scene. They didn't know what had happened, how all these people had died here. They found the girl who had been lucky enough to survive and found out from her what had happened. At night, the men arrived at the entrance to the town. And as soon as they approached they were spotted the two sides immediately engaged in a firefight. It was the Tyrese siblings who were guarding the fence. And instead of Governor returning, it's Rick they. The girl came straight out and told Tyrese not to shoot. Then said that Governor had shot at them and killed everyone and that Rick and the others saved her. Tyrese siblings can't believe it. Rick also shouted don't shoot. They talk face to face and then stepped forward with his hands in the air. Tyrese opened the door straight away and asked what they were doing here. Rick said they had come here to finish the job, but they had seen what Governor had done. The girl said Andrea had gone over the wall to the prison earlier, but they never saw her and Rick suspected she had been caught by Governor again. Tyrese led them straight to where Governor was holding people, and as soon as they entered they saw the blood on the floor and already had a bad feeling. Only pray that it wasn't Andrea. As soon as they opened the door they saw Milton lying on the floor and Andrea on the side of the door. Andrea collapsed against the door, thankfully alive. But unfortunately, she had been bitten, the atmosphere was instantly oppressive. Andrea asked how the people in their prison were doing and Rick reassured her by saying that she belonged to them too, that they were family and that they all alive and well. Relieved. Andrea smiled and told Michonne that she was glad she had left town and joined their family. Michonne was already sobbing. She and Andrea had spent eight difficult months together and they had become sisters. Many viewers thought Andrea was stupid. But in fact she was just easily confused by appearances and never wanted anyone to get hurt. She was a girl who screamed in the face of zombies, but slowly learned to use a gun, to kill them in close quarters, to stand up for Carol when she was in danger. This strong girl deserves to be remembered by all. Now Andrea is begging, she has to fix herself. She doesn't want to leave them with this problem. Rick handed the gun to Andrea and she looked at them sadly. But then she was relieved to see her good friends and family before she died. She is already happy. They closed up the room and Michonne stayed with Andrea. In the early morning a large truck drove into the prison. Governor was not dead yet. The war was definitely not over yet. Rick looked away. This time Lori didn't show up again. Their team had grown in size. His responsibilities had grown and his decisions were harder. 